history laid the foundation that informs our conversation. Welcome to the class. From the church house. to the streets. Good afternoon and welcome to this week's episode of Fannie Lou's Classroom. Remember to follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Fannie Lou's Classroom. Listen, we want to shout out our amazing team that makes this happen every week. Our engineering team, let's give a shout out and a good warm welcome to Roche and Brooke. And part of our production team is here today. We have our executive producer, Candice Lowe, and our production team member, Shanika Wilkerson. We're happy to have them with us today as well. So listen, today's topic is going to be amazing on Juneteenth, faith, freedom, and our future. In now don't you dare be late. We need retention, not detention. So today in class, we want to bring someone to your attention as we talk about this uh, idea of freedom. Freedom is going to be the theme for today as we talk about on Juneteenth, faith, freedom, and the future. And I want to introduce you to someone named Belinda Sutton, who at the close of the American Revolution was at that time a free woman, but she had been enslaved and she had been bound to a Harvard benefactor, Isaac Royal. And in 1783, she received reparations from the government, and it is one of the first known documents documented cases of that reparations were given to a person who was formerly enslaved. And so part of we talk about what is, when we say freedom, what do we mean? Oftentimes we think about not being physically enslaved any longer, but we know that we look historically at freedmen's towns. We look at the ways in which black folks have always sought to be free to be, and that is freedom to be able to do all we want to do without fear, without terror, and without having to be constantly up, have our backs against the wall as it relates to systems, structures, institutions that continue to be undergirded by white supremacy. And so we just want to have a broader conversation on today around freedom. And you know, in a couple of days, we will commemorate and celebrate Juneteenth. And so we thought, what better way than to have an amazing guest with us who could really talk to us about the importance of Juneteenth, what it means for us today. Uh, and I just want to say I'm um, kind of fan struck. I have followed our guest, uh, for quite some time now, uh, always seeing him in newspapers, on TV, and many other places. It's my first time being able to see him in the flesh close up and talk to him. So I'm super excited. And we have Mr. Ed Gray. Many of you may know him throughout the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex or wherever you may be watching from. He is a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And he is a graduate of Carter High School right across the street from Friendship West. He also received an Associate's of Arts degree in Applied Sciences in 1986 from El Centro Community College, where he went on to begin his matric matriculation at SMU in, right here in Dallas, where he majored in sociology and minored in political science. Mm -mm. It was during this time at SMU that he would begin his career as a civic volunteer in the cities of Dallas, Arlington, and Grand Prairie. He would later go on to be nominated for the prestigious Harry S. Truman Scholarship. So we have a scholar in the house, which was based in his educational achievements and work for human rights. Ed is currently active as a political consultant through Ed Gray and Associates, and is a husband, a father of four, and a grandfather of three, all while still active in the community. He is also a political commentator on WFAA's Inside Politics and radio host of KHVN's The Commission Community Champion Hour. You can catch more on uh, Mr. Gray's bio. If you look below, you'll see a link to his bio. You can get more information. But here it is. He is also, okay, catch this. He is... Uh, has his own radio and podcast show, The Commish Radio Show. So we want to check that out. We'll talk about that a little later. So as we are accustomed to doing, let's give a warm welcome to Fannie Lou Classroom. Let's welcome Mr. Ed Gray to our podcast today. 
So thank you, Mr. Gray, for being here. Uh, I'm super excited about this topic because I know in a couple of days, you know, a lot of people are going to celebrate, commemorate Juneteenth. And we also think about the ways in which Juneteenth is now a national holiday. And what does that mean for the commercialization of the holidays? So I want to really talk about um, not just why we commemorate and celebrate, but what does that mean? How do we look to Juneteenth as a point of departure to talk about how we can build a sustainable future for our communities? As we look back, more of a Sankofa moment, how we look back in order to move forward. So we have a few questions we want to throw at you. And of course, you know, you can just give us a history lesson too. You can just do what you do because you're well equipped. But I want to start, it may sound pretty basic, but believe it or not, a lot of people don't know what Juneteenth is. Right. So if you could just start and just tell us what is Juneteenth? Well, Juneteenth is when uh, the African Americans were last freed in the United States of America. And the General Granger read at Galveston, Texas, on June 19, 1865, that uh, African Americans were free. On paper. On paper. Sort of like being in America right now, you know, on paper. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, on paper we were free, but mentally and physically uh, we were still in shackles, and we still are to this very day. So let's just stay right there for a moment. So just a couple of months ago, right, we all were able to, unfortunately, learn about the horror and the terror, domestic terrorism in Buffalo, New York. Right. So I'm wondering, I always, when I see things like that, I wonder about when we think, oh, why do we have to worry about history? Why do we need to be concerned about history? That was in the past. Um, that happened so long ago. And I always think it's so important for us to continue to connect the dots for people. So can you talk to us about why Juneteenth, why celebrating it, how we might think to celebrate that in order to better understand the social structure we live in? that we're constantly trying to deconstruct and reconstruct that can be more equitable and get rid of some of the hierarchies that create all this human value or lack thereof placed on black bodies. I believe, sister, what, we, what we're what we doing when we celebrate Juneteenth, we are celebrating a continuum, as you stated. And that was when we first achieved freedom. But since then, we're having to consistently fight to keep it, as we just noticed from the recent uh, massacre in Buffalo. We're, we're having to fight to retain it. Retention, I believe, was one of the words you earlier stated. So that's what we're doing. So the celebration of Juneteenth is not just a celebration in which we talk about having a, a Kool-Aid and red soda water and, and, and watermelon and, and that type of thing. It's coming together as one to celebrating getting over. Not getting over in America, but getting right. over. right getting over slavery. But this is where we're at now. Buffalo, Buffalo, uh, the Buffalo Massacre is a long line of continuum of massacres that existed in the United States. We can go all the way back to 1863 when the first massacre had, had been uh, noted, which was in New York City. When we're talking about the Civil War. We talked earlier stated about the Civil War. You told me I can drop some history. You yes, know, go, be please like, do. Like Pac used to say, introduce a topic and drop it. So what we're going to go ahead and do, we're going to talk about the historical nature of Juneteenth and go back a little further. 1863, they had riots in New York City because they were trying to draft people to fight in the Civil War. So they instead had a massacre in New York in which they targeted African Americans. That's no different than the recent targeting in New York, which is Buffalo, where the young man targeted African Americans. That's no more different than Tulsa, right. where we had the Tulsa massacre. I remember as a kid, they used to call it the Tulsa race riots, but it wasn't a race riot. It was right. a massacre. So you end up having that. We, I remember as a young man, I went to the movies and we were talking about Rosewood that happened mm -hmm. in Florida. Again, another massacre. America consistently massacres African Americans. Slocum, Texas. If people in Texas think that that stuff don't happen nowhere else, but it happened in Slocum, yeah. Texas. Look it up. The Slocum, Texas massacre. And we also have had massacres in Orangeburg, South Carolina. That happened in 1968. And mm -hmm. then, can we not forget Charleston? Right. So there's a long line right. of massacres that have existed. 
And we've always consistently said the same thing. I can't believe this is happening. Insert the date. I can't believe this is happening Mm -hmm. because it was 2022 that this happened. You know, it was like last year someone said something. I can't believe that they lynching people in 2021. They chasing people down in Mm -hmm. pickup trucks in 2021, shooting them. But now they're doing the same thing in Buffalo now. You know, we had, we're we catching the same. I mean, you, I'm, I'm saying I'm here in Fannie Lou's classroom. I've Come already on. been in timeout already. I don't want to be in timeout again by using be- bad words. But this is the same type of stuff that's always happening. Right. But we have to keep celebrating Juneteenth because mm-hmm. we're still here. We're playing that's like right. that old movie Rocky where Apollo Creed is beating Rocky up. And then he says, I'm still standing. I'm still, you didn't knock me out. I'm still standing. And this is where we're at with America on Juneteenth, 1865. You didn't kill us. Project 1619, you didn't kill us. 1776, you declared your independence but still had us in chains. You didn't kill us. We're still standing. And that's why we celebrate Juneteenth. That's what this is about. And I think what you're saying is so important. And it's more about we celebrate and commemorate because it lets us know the perseverance that we have, that we have always been the people who have fortified faith, right? And I, I don't. I also want to think about the ways in which, uh, well, let me back up. You started really calling the role on all of what we should be calling massacres and not riots, right? And you mentioned some of Red Summer really by some of the, sa- the towns that you mentioned. And I often tell people, why do we say that's in the past? It's just different iterations of it. And I'm just wondering how in the moment of Juneteenth, like what would be one thing uh, we could do during our commemoration and celebration to be able to get people to see the continuum, but not just the continuum, but what do we do now? Uh, how do we um, look for ways to be safer in our communities? I mean, because now when you look at it, it's like daily activities have become deadly activities, right? So it's like you go to the grocery store, now anything could happen. Um, you know, you don't have to go to the grocery store. You, you could can be, be sitting in downtown your in your house, right? You know, eat a bowl of ice cream. Yes, you could be laying in bed, and then the police come in in Louisville, Kentucky, and right. shoot you. Uh, and, and, and it happened in Chicago uh, before that. And you know, this is this this is this is where we at, and where we at is the same place. Sad that we were at a hundred years ago. And so I'm wondering then, in some aspects, so as we talk about, because you just really, you know, really and beautifully laid out just historically how these are just, it's just a continuum. And I think about now, though we know for the record, critical race theory is not taught in schools, what they're calling critical race theory is history that they don't want taught in school. So I'm wondering, with that being the case, how do you see um, this attack, quote unquote, on critical race theory in schools, which really are trying not to teach real history, and then Juneteenth becoming a national holiday? Like the contradiction, right? Like don't teach history in school, but now we're going to celebrate this holiday as a national holiday. What do we do with this? And how do we make sure our children, and really it's American history, but how more importantly, we make sure we do not lack on teaching generations the story? Well, one thing we can do is we need to have more classrooms like Fannie Lou's. So that's what we need to have in which we can go ahead and teach our children, each one, teach one, reach one. And that's what I did with my my children. We went to the library right down the street here, you know, right down the street, the Polk uh, Library. Went down the street and went to the library, and I had them pick out books. Books they picked out. They could pick out any kind of book they want to, but don't bring me no books unless you have some books that have some black faces on it. Now, the sad thing about that is critical race theory is that the way we have education in the state of Texas, most of the kids even in South Lake, would, would not be reading these books, not because they're black, but because our education level in the state of Texas is in the bottom 25. But yet critical race theory is taught not in high schools, not in elementary schools, it's taught in law school. So I say to people when 
they say, take critical race theory, take that out of our public schools. It's not in our schools. And your kids are not collectively speaking. Right. Your kids collectively aren't on that level. Now, where we go at from now, I just uh, illustrated a point of what we could personally do by personally taking our kids to school, to, uh, also taking them to the library, rather, to, to pick the books out. But keep in mind, we have people, we just finished this election uh, just recently, and congratulations to the new congresswoman who just was elected uh, this past month. So keep in mind, over in Fort Worth, Matt Krause was running for uh, office before he decided to change and become the district attorney. He was the guy who was talking about critical race theory and was talking about banning books. So now we have a situation where the only books that you have, you're going to be in charge of it. So that's what we have to do. We have to remain, keep vigilant on that. Now, once they start banning books, this is what's going to happen, folks. Check it out. No other countries ban books except Adolf Hitler's Germany. But these people are not that far apart from that, if you will. But they'll start banning books, and then the next thing they'll start saying is that we're having Black History Month, and now that's causing our children headaches. They're going to start taking Black History Month out of school. I remember when I was in school, telling my age, it wasn't Black History it was Negro History Week. Then it became Black History Month. It, it graduated. Negro History Week, Negro History Month, Black History Month, and now we have what we have now, African American history. Now they're trying to take that out of the classrooms with the books. You can't go to the library, the, the school library. You won't be able to read Roots. It's going to come out because someone's going to have their feelings hurt. You won't be able to read anything from uh, Dr. Maya, Angelou. They're going to take it out. Now, once they start taking the books out, the next thing they're going to start saying is, we don't need no Black History Month. We don't need that. They're going to start taking that away. And then you got Juneteenth as a holiday, but it becomes an emasculated holiday now because you didn't cut everything off. And th that's where we at on that. Yeah, and that's my biggest concern, right, that this huge contradiction exists. And I'm wondering, are we thinking about how are we going to counter this? Because it's going to happen to your point. That's what's going to happen. That's how things progress. When you do a little bit here, you do a little bit there, you do a little bit there, next thing you know, everything is gone, and people look up and say, what happened? What happened? Right. And so I, I, it's this conscious raising that I think we have to do. And to a degree, I'm wondering, how do we – so let me ask you this question. We think about Juneteenth, okay, that was for the, you know, the folks here in Texas, our ancestors to, to, to hear that they were free, quote unquote, right? So I'm wondering, do you know about uh, any other freedom movements, right? Um, I would say even beyond these borders in the Americas as it relates to black folks in the diaspora and how, what kind of dots can we, because I just believe that we have to even see ourselves beyond these borders as black people. Hmm. Right. In terms of connecting our struggle with more of a global struggle, because what we see happening in America is happening in other places because of the ways in which colonialism is around the world. And so I'm just wondering, how can we perhaps link up what we were able to do post? I mean, even post Reconstruction, Jim Crow, I mean, how to your point, how. Even though they throw stuff at us, not physically any bound any longer, but the ways they try to bound us in other ways, we tend to always seem to break break out and, and still achieve. And I'm just wondering, is there power in, as we use Juneteenth as a point of departure, right, somewhat of a call of um, coming together, a centering point to say, this is where we've come from, but look at what we... We may have come from enslavement, but we were never slaves, right? We started talking about those Negro spirits, right? Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Understanding that they didn't take the mind and that, you know, we have to understand how do we keep a strong mind? And sometimes I think it's helpful because day to day we can look at what's happening. We can feel like, you know, this constant assault on black bodies is just too much to bear, right? Just be being wounded in the trauma, 
the everyday trauma that can exist, but I'm wondering if it's beneficial, if you could think about some other freedom struggles and some other ways in which black folks have broken free. And that could be, you know, Haiti, 1804. Right. I'm just wondering okay. how can we begin to connect the dots with these various freedom movements and point to the parts of where we felt we were getting a breakout. Well, that's a good point. And in talking to that point, sister, uh, I think first of all we have to change the we have to change how we view it. Number one, first of all, we've often said slavery and and and, and, and it's human trafficking. That's number one. We start we start changing the words now, and then we say the words, but then we we give it new meaning. So now. Slavery, okay, we descended from slaves. No, we didn't. We didn't descend from no slaves. We descended from people who were enslaved, okay? Now, if you want to know the word enslaved, well, slave is taken from a Slavic term. So that's really meaning white people were slaves, but we're not going to talk about them for a minute because this is our experience, and our experience means that we have been celebrating Juneteenth for many years, even before Juneteenth actually became a reality, because as you were t- talking about people that were human traffic who were enslaved, who were put on plantations. Wait a minute, hold on, let's change that word. No such word as plantations now. Let's call them enslavement camps. Plantation is like somebody's just sitting on a veranda, sipping mint juleps, the Negroes out in the field singing and everything, but that's not the way it happened. It's an enslavement camp. It's an enslavement camp. So we have an enslavement camp. So now we're talking about the story that I was heard was that Massa Lincoln freed us. But no, no, if we're talking about the experience of African Americans and African Americans are truly Americans in the North American continent. If Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, he never landed in America proper. He landed in Haiti. He landed in the Bahamas. So therefore, we can say the first African Americans were not freed by Abraham Lincoln. They were freed by Toussaint Louverture in Haiti. So we were always striving to become free. And we didn't wait for some white man named General Gordon Granger in 1865, to go ahead and read the Emancipation Proclamation because it was already done in the 1800s with Toussaint. So we already have that done. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. If we're talking about on the planet, not the planet, but on the continent, the continent of North America, the first African Americans were freed not by Mr. Lincoln, but by Mr. Guerrero who was the second president of Mexico, who was an Afro-Latino. A lot of people don't realize that. I talked to some of my Mexican brothers. They go, I didn't know that. He was the one who decided that we were going to go ahead and free all of the black people in the province of Texas. So the first African-Americans in Texas was not freed in 1865. It was done in 1821. And then you had all these other people come along and everything through the borders and everything because they had bad border problems back then. But the border problems wasn't people coming from the south, coming up north. It was people coming from the south, meaning Mississippi and Alabama, bringing our slaves. And that's when we end up having that. But when we talk about that, we never talk about the fact that in Louisiana, right before, right before the War of 1812, right before the War of 1812, there was a revolt in New Orleans that occurred. That occurred as well. We're not talking about Charleston. We're not talking about Denmark Vesey. We're not talking about Nat Turner. These things and these revolts that were celebrating independence were pre-1865, pre-Juneteenth, because we're talking about Juneteenth, we're talking about freedom. But these were attempts, not attempts, because they were free. They got that freedom but they were brought back in. But that is the global side of that. The global side, even in what we refer to as the American Virgin Islands, they were free too. Before 1865, African Americans, if we consider people who live in the Virgin Islands as being African Americans because the Virgin Islands is part of the United States of America, 
They had that freedom before 1865 as well. So if we, we look at this from a global dynamic, a global dynamic, then we, we realize that. And I'm also concerned about our folks in South America, the largest continent, uh, and the, not the largest continent, rather, but the, the largest amount of people that are descended from Africans right. is in Brazil. Right. Brazil. Brazil. Nigeria. We go to the motherland. Nigeria. It's more Nigerians in the world in Nigeria than it is Russians in Russia. But yet when we talk about this, we go ahead and we diminish we do, not only do we diminish our freedom, we diminish our history. And that circles us back to what we were talking about, critical race theory, and bringing it all and making it relative to the day. That was a, a, a good history lesson, right? But I think, for me at least, I always feel like, uh, I think Dr. Jeremiah Wright often said, if you don't know your roots, you won't know your roots. Like, I think it's always important for us to really understand um, what has happened before? Because it shows that we. Because I think sometimes when people say they don't want to uh, hear about it, history, it, it happened so long ago. It's because they start their history at uh, human trafficking, right? When we came to the shores, up and against what we were before, where we saw one European on the continent of Africa, right? And so I think it's so important to talk about that history, but also talk about the ways in which we resisted. Right. And still not just survived. In many cases, we thrived. Right. And I think, of course, that's why they don't want that history to be taught. Because what does that tell young black children? Right. That you are you descend from. And it's true from kings, queens, mm -hmm. uh, you know, woodsmen, you know, anything you can think of scientists, um, you know, medical. It's everything you can think of. That's where you come from. Right. And I think that. I'm always wondering how we can just use things like a Juneteenth to kind of continue to jump that off to teach that history because it's definitely not going to be taught in the schools. And more to me what's troubling with Texas is that we know whatever that curriculum is, whatever it's produced in those books, the rest of the country will follow. That's true. So it just won't be Texas students who won't get the truth. That's going to be widespread. And what does that mean for all the families in those states? Are they even equipped to even talk about? You know, so I'm also concerned about how do we get this out to even broader communities and what we can do in our own respective locations. And then, I mean, we on social media now. It opens up the world. We're more connected in how we might use our platform and our privilege to really tap into areas that mm -hmm. otherwise people don't touch. Um, so, yeah, I just want to talk about that for a minute because I thought that I think it's just important to understand, to your point, that wasn't the first time we experienced freedom or or took our freedom. Right. Right? Because uh, we talk about Harriet Tubman too, right? It's just So we've always had ways that we resisted, but I want to – Pivot here, because uh, you mentioned, because you brought him up, Reverend Nat Turner. So I also want to talk about the role of faith mm -hmm. um, in our resistance, our collective resistance from the from when we arrived here, right? The ways in which we have resisted from the very beginning. There's always been resistance. It's never we just took what was given to us. That's probably the dominant narrative that is given, right? Um, so I always want to dig that up and talk about the role of faith. Uh, historically, the the role of faith in this is is very basic, and it's base because that's where we lay our foundation. Because you don't, if you don't have faith, you don't have anything else. Because now you become free when you're in the quarters, the Negro quarters, the slave quarters, so to speak, mm -hmm. and then you go ahead and you 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 manage to eke out your freedom one way or or another on that. But now once we get beyond that to 1865 and we go through Reconstruction and we start opening up our own churches because I, some of my brothers was talking about, well, you know, uh, Christianity is, is the, the religion that enslaved black people. It's like, no, no, they, they read out of the Bible. No, they read out of a Bible that they picked up, that they chose certain passages that they could have. They had their own Negro Bible that they preach black people for. You had this, but you, but this other one about the Exodus, you didn't have that. That wasn't in there. So now when you start realizing the whole entire faith portion of the Bible and you start reading the Bible on that, and then you have a form of liberation theology that comes out. Now, when I think about liberation theology, I think about 
brother James Cone, who came from Fordyce, Arkansas. Right. Shout out to all those people in Fordyce. You spell it F O F O R D Y C E, but you don't pronounce it like that. People that call it Fordyce. It's like Lancaster and Lancaster. Lancaster. That's the way you do it. So that <laughs> if you if you're from here, you would know that. So anyway, that's what it is. So Fordyce, Arkansas, that's where my father's from. So and Stamps, Arkansas, down the road, all that's around the corner. But he came from a small backwaters place and came up with liberation theology. And and now we 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 see that. And 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 we can see that here in this classroom, which is Fannie Lou's classroom, and we can see that at Friendship West. We can see that all over, and we can see that from many other churches as well. And that's where we have our faith cooked. And I said, stated earlier, I said, uh, we're in the classroom, but we're cooking. We, 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 we're getting this knowledge, and this is where we're at. And, and that's how we move ahead as well. Yeah, I think that's The recipe a- for freedom begins first with the quest for knowledge. You can't, you can't cook anything unless you have a main ingredient, and the main ingredient right. is knowledge. And I'm glad you said that. So a couple of things. So I think it's Dr. Greg Carter said, you know, we have our knowledge by facts, our knowledge by faith, and our knowledge by opinion, right? And I think uh, to what you, your point you just made is the knowledge by faith and knowledge by fact that I think we've always had going for us as, uh, as a people. And when you think about black liberation theology and why it's so critical and why it's so important and why do we have to have black liberation theology? Why can't we just have theology? Well, it's because we have to center the experience of black people in this country or really throughout the diaspora, right? So we can be able to look to scripture to see how, what does this God have to say about this, right? This God beyond the text that we're reading, what does it have to say about our situation? How do we move and navigate all that we're up against in this country? Something has to inform that. And I think faith is so critical to that. And I think about, and you probably know a lot about this too, but I I always try to think about like the black clerical role, like a high on rebels, during Reconstruction, who was a pastor, but also a politician. And so how he took that faith into a very public square in order to be that voice. And so can you talk to us a little bit about how you probably see like a maybe current day Nat Turner's Hiram Rebels and how you may see that could be beneficial um, to really keeping our story, our history, not only alive, but sh- connecting the dots with people in a public way, those who have that platform to do so if you see that happening today or do we or is that something we're missing that can bind us together in a more uh public way instead of one-on-one or if i go to your church i might not hear it but you have some folks who have a platform who can reach millions and i'm wondering if we have those type of voices today yeah that's a set up question (laughs) but you know where we're at right now again friendship west where we are now that's one of the uh uh, pastors uh, here Dr. Freddie yes. Haynes, he clearly does that, but we need more people like that. And and when we do have more people like that, and we have more people that stand out like that, you will have a reaction. And the reaction is always uh, a reaction that we received back after 1865 when we received our, our freedom. The reaction is, is, is going to be negative because they're going to try to shut you down. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken... Uh, during that time period, uh, within the last couple of years, the following things have happened. Number one, uh, uh, the Congresswoman uh, Maxine uh, Waters, Maxine Waters had, had was was scheduled to be here, but she didn't come here because of death threats. That came right. Here. That's right. A lot of people don't realize that that's the reason why she didn't come. That's the reason why, folks. That's the reason why she didn't come because during that same time frame. A guy that was the president of the United States, he's been twice impeached, but, you know, we, his name escapes me right now. But uh, he's now been— Dr. Haynes tw- calling 46 minus one. He's been <laughs> the, the, the twice impeached president of the United States. He, he, he basically has sent out what right. was dangerous. And the dangerous portion of it is we saw on January 6th. And, and I think when we have people who become the Reverend Hiram Revels, the Reverend Nat Turner, these people come out that there's going to be a reaction. But we have to be strong to stand beside those people who are leading. 
and this is the first opportunity I've had to say this, but all these folks from Fort Worth riding on motorcycles couldn't find a quick trip to pull into, but they came here at Friendship West messing with our classroom, Fannie Lou's classroom, trying to do that. We can't have that. But that's what we need to have African Americans who are truly free, ones that are free. The ones that are not free, staying on the sidelines like you've been. But if you are free and you are listening to this, go ahead and share this out on Twitter and Instagram and share it out on YouTube so we all can be free because we need to shoulder up those people who are leading us today. And it's not, it's not the fact that we don't have people that are doing it. It's just the fact we need more of us doing it. And I'm wondering what does that take? Because some of that has a lot to do with just the internal, right? Do you have the courage? But first it's also, is your, because the liberation starts in your mind first before you can <laughs> engage in liberation. Yeah, struggles. you told me I couldn't say bad words. I was going to say free your mind and <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so I think it has to happen in our minds first. And I just think in a lot of instances, I don't know if it's the trauma that we face every day, it's some the wounds that we have, we just cannot seem, we first have to be healed, right, to the point. Because I think we're always going to be in that space. And that's just humanity, right? We all deal with something. So I think it's this notion, as Dr. Ivor Carruthers would say, that we're wounded uh, warriors trying to be wounded healers as we do this, uh, this quest for justice, peace, love, and liberation, right? And so... I'm always curious, like when I talk to people who have been in this way longer than I have, like yourself, and seen so much more, I'm always trying to figure out, you know, and I think that's why I look to Juneteenth as a point of departure that people can have be on alert. Cause, you know, people, they like celebrating, commemorating. So while you're coming out to have a good time, how do we also, boom, let me give you this lesson right here. Uh, how do we use those moments to free our minds, because it has to start there first. Other than that, people will come out to maybe a rally or a march and go back home, and you don't see them again, right? So I think you, because I tell people, you know, if you are free Negro, there's nothing people can do to you. There's nothing you won't say and do no. for your people, right? And so I think that's a big part of it. How do we really, get, how, the, how do we get free? And the, the things that we do, asking the question, you know, as they do, um, oftentimes some people will say, you know, how does this get us free? Give us free. <laughs> so, you know, that's what, what this is really about, you know, using the platforms that you have, whatever platform it is, uh, whether or not it's music, whether or not it's my daughter just had a play, stage play downtown called Rage. It's a, it's a story about African-American women overcoming. Uh, so that's one way to go about doing it. Chuck D, public enemy, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he he used a platform of of rap, you know, to do what he did and still continues to do what he does. Uh, the platforms that we have here on social media, being able to go ahead and tweet out our responses to things. And then the last thing is that how we can get freedom and how we can be done as well is the same way we, we were doing it before in, in the 60s when we're talking about Dr. King, when before he died, his last speech that he gave was on a Buy Black campaign. You know, that's what that's we're right. talking about. So that that's how we can do it. Freedom needs to be exercised every day. Now, my concern about freedom is that uh, since it's a holiday, we're going to start having that. They ain't, haven't did it yet, but, you know, they are. This is America. You know, they have Martin Luther King Day sales on stuff. Right. I know they're going to have Juneteenth sales. What are they going to call it, a white sale? I don't know. But, you know, this is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So what, we gonna, what, what, what are they going to advertise? What, what are they going to do that for? Because that's what America is about. It's a consumerist society that's based on that. But the only way we can achieve freedom in, in this new era, if you will, is to exercise our freedom economically as well. And that's how we can tie this in with Juneteenth, what it means to me, how we can go ahead and do that. Do a campaign. Do a campaign where you're buying black. Do that campaign as well. If we're doing that and then turn that around into our schools and to our churches, we can build Black Wall Street up one dollar at a time, and it'll be a digital Wall Street in which you, we don't have to drive down Elm Street to see it. 
it can exist right here in your phone, on your phone right now by doing that. That's how we go ahead and we do it. That's how we use the platform that we have now to achieve freedom going forward. Having parades is good. I mean, you know, that's a good thing. I, I think it was uh, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, who had said once the, about Dr. King in, on April 4th, 1967, one four year years before he died, he said at the National Cathedral, he said, yeah, I'll go here, you preach, because, you know, uh, uh, you, you make me feel good. I can stomp my feet, that kind of thing. But where do we go from here? So this is where we go from here. What do we do from here? Where do we Riverside. Go it was Riverside. No, uh, yeah, and I, the, I think that's that's the ultimate question, right? And I think I'm always wrestling with that. Where do we go from here? Even, you know, King's last um, last book, right? Uh, that uh, I, That's just always, for me, that's what I struggle with every day in doing this work when I look around what's happening and we see so much has to be done. Um, and so much we're up against. We look at uh, every good category, we're at the bottom, whether, whether that's black wealth, comparative to others. Um, and then we're at the top of that, which is not the best. The so black women right. in Texas, the highest maternal mortality rate. Right. And the fact that there's no outcry, that we're not outraged that black women, 11% of live births, 27% of maternal mortality rate. I think anybody else, it would be a, it would be a national crisis, right? And so I'm just wondering. That's where, that, that is where, hey, that's where the vice president can do so. You know, everybody always looks at, at, at people in the bully pulpit, so to speak, and, and say, hey, look, you know, we got a black vice president. We got a black vice president. Okay, now you're vice president. Okay, you got your chucks on. I got that. You look good. You look good. But now we have all these sisters here, and you're a sister too. Go ahead and address that. I mean, you... I mean, you know, because I've been—I just read this book just recently, and they were—they were talking about where is she going? Where is she going from here? Well, that's one place to go. You know, I always like to view where am I going to go from here? Mm -hmm. Go back home to the hood. I since they ain't paying for Fannie Lou's classroom, we ain't gonna mention their names. But go back to the hood and go back to the go back to the barbecue places and stand in line and see what the brothers and sisters are talking about in the barbecue places. What they're talking about is what you need to talk about. But it's it's hard to do that when you're at Capitol Grill meeting. Well. Meeting with people. It's hard to do that when Bitcoin people are, are paying are paying your campaign. I'm, I'm, I'm just calling the way it is. But now when we get to the opportunity to be where we're at to help somebody, go back and help somebody who don't sit at Capitol Grill who don't have Bitcoins, but are struggling to sit there and looking at their wallet to see if they can get that sandwich. That's what we need to do. Yeah, and I definitely agree with uh, what are some ways in which, um, and this is something that I'm, so I won't get too ahead of myself, but something that I'm working on with a colleague is how do we begin to do more of really talking to the people? And, and that's just not just us, but that's all of us who are in this work who, who are it about the business of what can we do to make sure our communities really do have access to life-giving, life-sustaining resources. That doesn't happen organically. It doesn't happen because somebody downtown at City, Cal at City Hall or down in Austin or in D.C. is doing that. Like, we have to really be a part of our own liberation. I've always believed that. that if you have to take part in your own liberation, you can't look to an elected official to do that for you. And what you can do is hold them very accountable, which we don't do. We give our power and agency away oftentimes, right? right? right. So, um, as you can see, I just sit, hit, hit a couple of people right there, like, hey, you there now? You did. You got to do something. <laughs> so, I, and, and so I think. I'm retired. They can't take my money. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's right. So, I think it's accountability for those who we have put in office. And I think it's, in, it's also our uh, job to make sure, like, hey, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because I think sometimes what we can do, and this can be with longstanding elected officials that we've known for decades, that I don't know if we are altogether comfortable and free enough to say, you know what, you're not really representing us. You're really not making a change for us. We're down here suffering, right? And I think about Shingle Mountain, for example, right, um, that no black 
elected official really went to and talked to Marsha Jackson, a black woman. I'm looking at the many times I was over there and never saw anybody. I'm listening to Marsha's story and what has happened to her. No return phone calls. And I've seen all these other white folks who come out and start. I'm like, well, how? so I'm up here galvanizing like black folks. Where are we? Cause it's not like we haven't been part of environmental justice moves before the language is even there. We have always been a part. So I, for me at least, and we're going to talk about Juneteenth commemorating and celebrate that. We got to think about what was it about many of our ancestors, right? That allowed them in the face of that kind of adversity to still say, we have this dignity about ourselves. We have this pride about ourselves and we're not going to let somebody, right? Whoever they are, right? To strip us from that, that we are human, right? And I, for me, at least, I never now try to beg people to understand why I'm human. Look at me. I'm black. I got hands like you do. See my humanity. I don't do that. I turn around and ask, what's it about you that you have a lack of humanity about yourself to love others' humanity that's in them, right? I think we have to turn that question around and start having that conversation up and against people to understand why we're human. But, yeah, go ahead. What were you going to say? Oh, I, I was going to go ahead and say uh, that's the reason why I don't protest. See, protest is, and, I'm, I, and now some people are going to say, well, we ain't, we ain't protest. <laughs> protest is a reaction to somebody else's power. I assert my humanity. See, if I was to go ahead and hit you, you say, why did you do that? That's called protest. But if you hit me back, you asserted your humanity to defend yourself. So I don't protest. I assert my humanity. So that's the change of the word. I'm not protesting your white supremacist overlording. I'm not doing that. I'm saying I have every right to do what you have. That's right. So therefore, I'm asserting my right. I'm not protesting you having that right. I'm asserting my right to do that. So that's what I do. I said that one time at SMU in the equal classroom. Like, Ooh, you don't protest? No, I don't believe in doing that. We're asserting our rights. That's what a brother Malcolm had said. He said, we assert our rights to be free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. That's what he said. He said that we can't. He was the first person who said he wasn't for civil rights. I'm for human rights. And people start saying, Ooh, why are you saying that? He said, you got to assert my humanity and recognize my humanity before you start talking about what kind of civil rights I have. Civil rights is, can I get a cup of coffee right. here? Can I go in this store? Can I do? We all have that now. And we're getting shot down, choked out, shot. Yeah, right, to your point, right? Yeah, but now it's our, our human rights, and that's, that's what we're saying. And, and I'm, we just finished you know, last month in Buffalo, the massacre last month that occurred in Buffalo. And I, I saw uh, a gentleman put something on, on social media, and he had all of these European-Americans. If I'm African-American, they got to be European-Americans because white is a sign of power. So when we, we, we call someone, we say somebody white, we're basically saying they are empowered. You should either call them Anglo-Americans or European-Americans. Because if we are hyphenated American, white ain't hyphenated. It's a condition of power that's asserted. So now will you have these individuals who, who, who are asserting that white supremacist background and everything on that. But they assert their humanity because they're allowed to go home. Brothers and sisters ain't allowed to go home. They're not allowed to go home because our humanity is not asserted or is not recognized. Right. So thank you so much for that. And so for this particular segment, we're going to wrap it up because this is more of our content. Because then what I like to turn to do is just have more of a 
you know, real organic conversation beyond uh, to learn more about Ed Gray, the person. I right. didn't think we could be no more organic than what I was just oh, we, oh, you're very, <laughs> this part was organic, but I mean, this more laid back, not so much heavy questions. Uh, it's just more, you know, just fun stuff at this point. Because uh, I know that we're well-rounded individuals and we're not the sum of who our, what our body of work may say. We may be, you know, you might be doing stuff nobody knows about. And they just want to know about the fun, Ed Gray. But before we do that, I do want to offer up, uh, and we'll put this book, you'll see the uh, information for this book down below. But I want to lift this up as a text to it's called On Juneteenth, which we got our title for t- for this episode, and it's by Annette Gordon Reed. It is a very good book on Juneteenth. And uh, Mr. Gray, do you have any other resources people may want to look about, look to to learn more about Juneteenth? I, I think you hit it off right there. That was the number one book right now, and uh, I believe we need to make sure we read that and, and and buy the book and don't share it. Just go ahead and buy it. Right. As part Don't, of that economic yeah, power that's what we're, we're talking, talking about. about. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> and if you can buy it from a black bookstore, probably going to be online, but still buy it from a black uh, seller. So what I want to talk about now is um, now, because, of course, I've seen you in plenty of publications, but I saved this one. And because I want you to tell people about this work that you do as well. And this was the Allen Brooks Memorial that we did. And so uh, talk to us about that work with Equal Justice Initiative that you do. Thank you, uh, the Equal Justice Initiative is Brian Stevenson's organization in, in, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. We have a local chapter here, Dallas County Justice Initiative. And what we did was we put a marker at the spot where Allen Brooks was lynched in 1910. So uh, we, we put that marker there, and it's a very large marker in the center of downtown Dallas, and it was approximately 40,000 people, if I'm not mistaken, several thousand people saw him lynch. But mm-hmm. this is where we're at now is that we are going throughout the city of Dallas and going to different spots. William Taylor uh, was lynched uh, at Trinity Groves. Uh, yeah, that's mm-hmm. true, Trinity Groves. And then there was another brother that was lynched out at Mountain Creek. So we ha- we're going to have Marcus Place there as well. We are at the process of, as I say, it's not historical revisionism. It's a fact of telling a story, and telling a story is about triumph. And This is a way Mm. of triumph. Uh, I was responsible for, partially responsible for that, Uh, also along with the Confederate statues that came down as well at Lee Park, formerly Lee Park. Uh, So we are taking down Confederate statues and bringing up monuments to people who are the true, true, yes. uh, well, they are the true heroes of the South. Now, I may get this wrong, but am I thinking correctly when I say that there's going to be some type of marker of a woman who was lynched downtown? Can you tell us about that? Jane Elkins. Uh, of course, they say it wasn't a lynching because she was, uh, she was capital murdered because she was convicted of killing her slave master. Wait a minute, hold on. It wasn't her slave master. It was her loaned out slave master. Because that this is a story that happened. Jane Elkins was a slave, and she was loaned out from her master to another master who took liberties with her body. Mm. And she took liberties as well, and she ended up killing him. She put a hatchet to his head. So when that ended up happening, she was found guilty and hung downtown. And the spot where she's hung at is approximately 200 yards away from where President Kennedy was murdered at. And it's called Martyrs Park. And that's also a spot where we're going to have a marker up as well. Within the last 10 years, we had started getting uh, to the point where the city of Dallas recognized first that that atrocity existed, and then second of all, they put a marker up saying Martyrs Park. But it, it is, it's, it's not a park. It doesn't have anywhere for you to sit. It is, it's nothing to, to denote that it's a park. It's right there before you get on the freeway to go to Parkland. You make that turn from the triple underpass, and you glance over, you go, like, oh, there's a park over there? Wow. That's where it's at. So that's where we're going to have that. That's where old Cato Miller, 
uh, who was one of the people who was enslaved by the Miller family. Uh, he was he and two other uh, enslaved African Americans were hung there as well. That's the spot where they used to hang people. That's the mm-hmm. spot where they hung people at, on the Trinity River bottom. And all this connects and goes back to why we have to commemorate and celebrate Juneteenth in a way that has us looking as a way forward as we as we look back. So tell us a fun fact about you. What do you enjoy doing? What brings you your greatest joy? Oh, wow. Talking to you. Oh. <laughs> no, but, you know, what brings my greatest joy is, is being able to get up in the morning time and do exactly what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. I, I work from... Uh, 41 years uh, at a telecommunications company here in town, and I decided that I was going to be my own master. (laughs) But I've always been my own master of my fate. Mm. But this time I decided that I was going to wake up every morning and set my own schedule. So I set my own schedule. So I I do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I have have, uh, fun helping people out politically and, doing that type of thing. That, that, seriously, that's what I do. Okay. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm now a gentleman farmer now. I'm, I'm, I'm focused more so on the gentleman part because I don't have a farm. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's pretty well what I do now. Okay, okay. Tell the people how they can find you, follow you. You have a podcast. Tell us about your podcast and how people can connect with you so they can follow you beyond Fannie Lou's classroom. I'm going to look right into that camera right there. And talk right in that camera right there. I want you to follow me on on Twitter, Ed Gray nineteen oh six on Instagram, Ed Gray nineteen oh six. Follow me on YouTube right now. You're looking at YouTube, Fannie Lou's classroom, but also tune in to Minds as well, the Commission Radio Show. So tune into that as well, and you can follow me there. And I appreciate you following. We're gonna deal with entertainment, sports, politics, and news. And as I've often said. The Commission Radio Show, loved by many, hated by few, respected by all, second to none. <laughs> I need to make sure I'm following you, too, especially on that Twitter, because I'm sure you drop heat on oh, that yeah. tweet. you tweeting them heat, don't oh, you, yeah. don't you oh, Mr. Yeah. Gray? <laughs> oh, yeah. But, you know, that's that's how I got on Channel 8. On, really? On, on, on WFAA. Okay. Yeah, I was I was tweeting, and, and Jason Whiteley said, hey, you have a radio show? I said, yeah. So, you know, people like, I don't follow Twitter. I don't got, that's how I got on TV. Listen, everybody, did you hear that? So you have, well, if you have something constructive, positive, not promoting domestic terrorism, white supremacy, <laughs> get on Twitter yeah. <laughs> and tweet about, or our folks, right? Our young people, uh, our folks who have all this influence, try to use your social media platforms, right, to a degree where we can lift each other up, connect the dots, and begin to really be able to pull together as a global community for all of our collective freedom. Because here's the thing, you may be a little bit free over here, freer than somebody over here, but at the end of the day, what we have found out that when it comes to domestic terrorism and white supremacy, they don't look to say who has the degree. No, Where did you come from? Are you a, a popular singer, right? I'm not going to go into something that recently happened where I was like, see, he was reminded he was a Negro. Yeah, I'm thinking about this before my time, but I know about it because I read. <laughs> I think about, you know, a Negro's turned black, right, back in the 60s when King was killed. And I'm wondering, what is it that's going to make us turn black again? What's going to make us turn black again? <laughs> Ask OJ. He found out. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> We want to thank you for tuning in to Fannie Lou's Classroom. Thank you for being here for this episode on Juneteenth, Faith, Freedom, in the Future. And we hope and pray that you learned a lot today. Hopefully you were able to get some nuggets and you can go down some rabbit trails and learn more about what was said on today. And remember to always follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and watch us on YouTube, Fannie Lou's Classroom. We'll see you next week, 12 o'clock Central Time. Bless from the church now.